I went to Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and then I moved to New York to go to grad school at Columbia. I happened to get a job working for Andy Warhol, working on Interview Magazine, which was sort of new at the time. I dropped out of Columbia before getting my master's degree, and just to see how he operated was more educational than college and grad school put together. I was the editor and art director, and you know, we were building something, and it started out really, really small, a little black and white underground newspaper, and we turned it into a commercial magazine with a fairly substantial circulation, you know, that covered film and music and the arts. I was born in Ohio. I spent a lot of my childhood there. I spent some of my childhood in New Jersey, outside of New York City, and I've lived here my entire adult life. And I loved clothes when I was a kid. I think it started with kind of dressing up, you know, like as a cowboy or an Indian or whatever. I basically had the authority to dress myself from a pretty young age, and I liked to go shopping, so my mother and my grandmother would take me shopping. I think I was more influenced by the movies. I used to love the way Jerry Lewis dressed. Not in character, but he would guest host The Tonight Show, and he always had like the sharpest tuxedo. When I was like an adolescent, and you know, you kind of things become a little bit more tribal. You know, where you're like a a preppy or a, mm -hmm. grease, a greaser or a, a skinhead, or you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and then the kids start to kind of evolve their own um, sort of tribal identity. I dressed the same as I did when I was. 12 and 18 and uh, 25 and 35. And I haven't had too many aberrations in terms of style. I probably almost bought a pair of Rick Owens boots because I decided it would be great to be tall. I actually wrote an article once for details about um, elevator shoes. I ordered a pair and I got the ones that made you the tallest. Um, they were uh, like fake Timberlands. I'm illustrating, I'm breaking two rules brown shoes and blue mm -hmm. suit, and um, my mother always told me that blue and green didn't go together, but I, I always thought it was a great combination. Seersucker suit that was made for me by John Pierce in, in London. He was one of the founders of Granny Takes a Trip. I was trying to find saddle shoes, and then I, I, I heard that Ralph Lauren had them. So I went up to the store, and they were out of my size. And I went to do an interview with Ralph and I complained and he sent me these shoes. These are vintage. These are actually from 18th century, I think. They're enamel, hand-painted. New York is all, a lot about business and work. It's also interesting, I think, because it's a place where things happen spontaneously and with a sort of random element that you won't find elsewhere. Things just happen kind of like by accident. New York was definitely the center of the art world in those days. I mean, now it's the center of the art business. I get asked about working with Andy a lot, and what I guess people today would call a workaholic, you know, because that's what he really liked to do was work. So it was interesting to watch uh, an accomplished artist do his work, but also kind of take care of the business side of it and the social side of it. I was like up all night laying out the issue, and the typesetters went home. So I made all the headlines out of blown up typewriter type. And it did look really good. But uh, Andy said, oh gee, that looks so great. You should do that for all the headlines from now on. So he was complimenting me, but he was also kind of telling me what to do in a back channel way. I learned to think of parties as work from him. I remember we were at a party one night and he said, oh, this is such hard work. And I said, wow, we're at a party. We're working. And then I said, we are working. But I, I never thought about like parties the same way after that. Nothing I would rather do than make films, but it's not that easy. I was with Ado and Mary Paul, and we were hanging out with Elio Fiorucci, and he said, oh, it's so great what's happening in New York. You kids should make a movie. And I think I said, that's a good idea. Um, why don't you get us the money and we'll make one? I wrote the treatment in about one day. I was the producer, Ado was the director, and I wrote the script, and we cast Jean-Michel Basquiat in the lead. We didn't want to make a, a documentary, because we thought that would be really corny, so we thought we'd make like a 
to sort of a walking around film about a you know somebody like us trying to do a band and making paintings and trying to pay the rent. That was made the same year as Charlie Ingram's film Wild Style. As they're sort of like bookend uh, documents of that time. Young men today, I think, have a lot of gaps in their education because I think they weren't parented in the same way that older generations were. And so they sometimes have like a less of a sense of identity or belonging or a uh, sense of occasion. My book is called How to Be a Man. A philosophy book disguised as a humor book disguised as an advice book. Basically written because I have a big audience of, of GQ readers because I write a column called The Style Guy. I deal with everything from love and marriage, sex, uh, clothing in every manifestation. The most common question I ever get is like over and over again I get like are your socks supposed to match your shoes or your trousers? And of course the answer is no. I think wearing sports stuff when you're not doing sports is strange. I don't like baseball caps unless you're playing baseball or golf. Um, I guess I'm just a square. A lot of guys are sort of, I think they get the feeling that they don't want to stand out because they don't want to get in trouble or they don't want to get made fun of. You know, your shoes are like so gay, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous, but you know, people are afraid to be different. They feel safety in looking like everybody else in the class or in, in, at the office. But that's not really how you get ahead, you know. It's probably the, the young executive who's wearing cufflinks, you know, and a nice tie that's going to wind up being the CEO in 30 years. Because he knows who he is and he's not afraid. It's such a basic thing that if you can conquer that fear, then you can conquer the next fear, which is probably more important.